residential estate is in the heart of the Surrey commuter belt. It's typical of the success, wealth and show of the modern age. And in the middle of it is this tower, which is typical of the success, wealth and show of the Tudor period. But it's also the tip of an archaeological iceberg, because if you look at this really old drawing, you can see that the tower is the gateway to a lavish palace which was once owned by some of the wealthiest men in the country, the bishops of Winchester. It's a palace that was once so admired that King Henry VIII literally stole one of the buildings. So how much of it survives under these beautifully manicured lawns? And how many of these gardens would it have once covered? The palace has been lost for over 300 years. We've got just three days to find it. Wainfleet Tower lies in Esher in Surrey. In the medieval period, it would have been three days' ride from Winchester and a day's journey from London by land or riverboat. It's named after the powerful 15th century bishop William Wainfleet, who built it at the height of the Wars of the Roses. We've been invited here by its current owner, Penny Rainbow, who spent years researching the history of her magnificent home. This is great, isn't it? It's somewhat blurry, but uh, well, it's pretty good. It's a fair sketch from a distance, but, you know, what's it going to be like in there amongst those buildings? Yeah. Mind you, Tudor Palace, uh, this, is, this is your period, isn't oh, it? Oh, <laughs> give me one of these. But the thing is, it's not quite Tudor. What do you mean? That's a thing. Well, you think about Tudor palaces with big brick gatehouses, maybe Wolsey at Hampton Court or Henry VIII at St James's, but this was built maybe 10, 20 years before Henry VII, the first Tudor, came on the throne. So this sets the standard for those brick-built Tudor palaces. What's this? Well, this plan of 1606 shows the gatehouse as it survives and then it looks like a socking great castle. And what's this over here? Well, I don't know what that is. It might yeah. be a chapel, but it looks three storeys and a stair turret could be guest lodgings. If that's all to play for, that one. Jonathan thinks that this early plan might just illustrate the late medieval layout of the palace in Wainfleet's time. It certainly shows Penny's tower with a courtyard surrounded by loads of buildings. Great targets for our geophys in Penny's back garden. Really? It's so frustrating. On day one, we just have to wait until they've geophys. Well, no, no, I, I've got a trench get for digging, you. Get digging, <laughs> yes, exactly. get digging. Yes, exactly. Well, let's do that, if you don't mind. Please do. Could, if, if you could be my guest. give us permission. <laughs> this is a zonking great building, isn't it? Isn't it? Now, what's a bishop doing building a great tower in, during the Wars of the Roses? Hang on, do you actually live in this? Yes. How, how many rooms have you got? <laughs> Five bedrooms. Wow. Yeah, but I mean, it's a, it's a nice house. It's yeah, a very yeah. pleasant, comfortable place. But was it always comfortable? That's my question. You've got a hole for a musket at the top, and then maybe arrows underneath. I mean, is this a bishop who's afraid for some reason? So if you've got arrow slits around the corner, and the 1606 map shows a big wall. So this would be coming off of yeah. this angle, yeah? yeah? pretty much down there. What's that wall doing there? It could be a thick wall with a parapet, like a curtain wall of a castle. You've got doorways coming out of this wall here in this direction anyway, so there must have been a range of buildings across here. Yeah, so I think we should put a trench somewhere across this range here, and then we're likely to pick up not only the curtain wall, but the, the walls of this range as well. Yes. Now think about this, because I think they're implying that they trash not only your back garden, but your front garden as well. That's fine by me. Go for it. Get digging. Go for it. Get digging. <laughs> we're Music off. to our ears. <laughs> so we're going to dig our first trench in Penny's front garden to see whether Wainfleet built a large defensive wall around his palace. Penny wants trenches, so no messing around, and digging starts straight away. William Wainfleet was one of the most powerful men in the 15th century. As Bishop of Winchester and Lord Chancellor, he owned 240 properties. But our search for his Isha Palace won't be easy. 
The bishops of Winchester lived here from the 12th century, and they, and any of its other owners, who include Henry VIII, Cardinal Wolsey, and Francis Drake's family, could have built on the site. Although Wainfleet's tower still survives, the rest of the palace was knocked down at the end of the 17th century, and the area's been landscaped on several occasions. All these phases complicate our search, but they're not the immediate problem for Phil. Look, we've got a main sewer coming here through where those bricks are to that manhole, and then at the same time we've got the, the canopy of the trees. We can't dig anywhere underneath there. None of this is possible. We really can't be digging any further than that down to the canopy over there, which is where your buildings are going to be. But we can survey the whole area. We can survey right up to the trees, so we can hopefully give you a plan. Tree roots might be a problem, but not all our clues are below ground. Since we want to discover more about the palace Wainfleet built, what better place to start than the tower itself? What is it that's so innovative about this building? Well, in the 15th century, we'd been at war with France. Now, we'd had a lot of experience of our generals going over to northern France and Flanders and seeing brick buildings. But it's exactly at this period, with that influence from the continent, the people like Wainfleet start building with simply with bricks. There's one here. Example, Farnham is just up the road. Yeah. And he's got exactly the same approach to building completely with brick. So is all of this building Wainfleet? Well, it's a jigsaw puzzle, Tony, because we've got 300 years of occupation here. Later improvements often have little bits of classical detail that these architects are so used to, they can't imagine doing without. That's a, a Greek key motif, and that is um, called the Vitruvian scroll. It's a wave motif. Penny's really keen that Wainfleet should be recognised as this really innovative architect. Mm. How do we work out which bits were him and which bits were tacked on by someone later? I suppose brick sizes are useful, aren't they? We can, we can have a look and see whether those bits with the diaper that are obviously Wainfleet's are the same size as, as some of these finicky bits. Uh, you taught me what diaper was about three years ago. It's those diamond shapes that they used to put on linen, hence exactly. the use of the word diaper, and here it just means a diamond. Bricks with a glaze, very decorative thing, and Wainfleet loves his diaper work. Penny's Gatehouse is an outstanding tribute to Wainfleet, and I'm intrigued to discover what else he built at Isha. John's got his geophys results for Penny's back garden, but there's a problem. Well, look, we've got the really good results you wanted, Phil. There's a clear building. We've got walls coming out beyond, even more walls. Um, but it looks as though that's all underneath the canopy. The main thing is, I think yeah. we can get the, the uh, corner, yeah. that corner there. Yeah. And that's only one branch, oh. isn't it? <laughs> it's a twig. Oh, a twig, a mere twig, right. <laughs> In the front garden, where we're trying to find out if there was a defensive wall, Jonathan and Matt have hit on archaeology. Fine mortar. And that's what he was 18th century. Mine was the 18th century, actually. Yeah, I'd be looking for bigger chunks of chalk knocked together with some little dark flecks. Yeah. So my guess would be you're talking about 18th century demolition. Yeah. We haven't found the wall yet, but Stuart's had a look at the early plan, and he's convinced it holds the key to Wainfleet's palace. This map, which... It's produced by Ralph Treswell. He's a spectacularly informative map. Yes, I've seen a blow-up of just that tiny space. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it includes a phenomenal amount of detail in the buildings, and it's actually a measured survey. Although the buildings are drawn as if they're a bird's-eye view, the way this was made was to make a plan and then draw the buildings on afterwards. It must be one of the very first measured maps, then. It is. I think there, there are a lot of clues on this map. I mean, this is a real gem to work with. So this early plan is a great starting point to search for Wainfleet's palace. It shows Penny's Tower as the gateway to the complex, with a possible defensive wall coming off the side. The mysterious chapel lies to the south. There's a keep in the next-door garden, and a large building, possibly a great hall, immediately in front of the gatehouse. So Phil and the diggers begin to open a trench in the back garden in order to test John's geophys and tie down the buildings. And in nearby Isha Place, we've set up an incident room where the rest of the team are busy trying to uncover clues about Wainfleet's master plan. Historian John Guy and our own Helen Geek are trawling through the records of the bishops of Winchester. By 1301, we know that 
Two carpenters were hired for mending the great gate. They're trying to find anything which might throw light on the development of the palace and Wainfleet's building activity. So where does this information come from? It comes from the bishop's pipe rolls. They're called pipe rolls because they were long membranes of parchment and then they were bound together at the top and then rolled up around the equivalent of a rolling pin. So they looked a bit like cylindrical pipes? That's right. But what these contain, Helen, is not, if you like, major building works, only repairs. The infuriating thing is that the major building work is on a separate roll and those rolls are lost. So if we know about this, can we look up in the pipe rolls about what Wainfleet's doing in the 15th century? We hope so, but this is really what we have to do in the next three days to actually you know, plough through all these Latin entries and see what we can find. Oh, gosh, how is your medieval Latin? Well, I've got my dictionary. <laughs> John's got 40 years of records to plough through, but we're hoping to give him a more specific target, so we've called in Mick the Twig to give a dendro date and tell us exactly when Wainfleet built his tower. Hey, up, Mick, you're spoiled for choice, aren't you, here? No, Tony, this is a really bad building for me. Oh, you always say that. No, I don't. This, this, <laughs> this, this, the outside of this building looks fantastic as you come down the drive, but once you actually get inside it, you start realising the building's been messed around with over the years. A lot of the original wood has gone. They brought lots of sort of reused bits of tack, as anyway I can describe it in here. The, the roof has gone at some point. A lot of the floors have gone, so there just is not that much timber in here that I can do anything with. Well, it all looks pretty old to me. No, look at this piece here. This, this looks like it's just come from the local builders' merchants. So you're being a bit well, rude about your house. He's being incredibly <laughs> rude about my house, isn't he? <laughs> Was that tack or tat? <laughs> yeah, what did you say? Tack? <laughs> it's a Shropshire thing. <laughs> 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 Despite these sarcastic country comments, Mix managed to locate a beam which he thinks might reveal the date of the tower. In Penny's back garden, Phil's beginning to find evidence of buildings. Oh, look, it, uh, ah, no, it's got the mortar. It's got the mortar. Look, it's got the mortar on it. But that's the edge of it. There's the. Oh, look, it's got some finger marks in there. Look. Oh, yeah. Well, they presume he must have just lifted it off. And there's the other edge. So that's one corner of it. Now there's the rest of it. Nice so. Do you fancy living somewhere like this? Oh, it's my dream house. I think I might make an offer. Yeah, not half. And it's in such good nick too, isn't it? It's beautiful. I mean, the quality of this whole thing is extraordinary. Look at the staircase. We just come down. Every brick individually curved to make that sweep. So much surviving from the 15th century. Yeah. Yeah. What's this thing here? Is it a fireplace? It seems rather bizarre to have one on a landing. I, I, I don't know what that is. There's, there's no flue there. You call it a gatehouse, but look, over here there's a big room which is now Penny's kitchen. Yeah. There's a huge thing here. Actually, this is the lift, which I don't think they would have had in the Tudor <laughs> period. But you've got another room there, another three floors above, isn't yeah. it? So you've got a host of rooms. Why does a gatehouse need all that? It's an inadequate description in a way, isn't it? It does much more. But other than offering people the sign of the entrance and a means to direct them through to the other buildings, you need a porter as well to make sure you know, security is adequate. And then there are big lodgings above because they're grand spaces with good views in a prominent position. You know, but three for the price of one, I'd say. Such a nice house. In the front garden, Bridge has been working on the wall trench for most of the day. How are you getting on then, Bridge? Well, we're getting down, Mick. <laughs> Doesn't look very interesting. No, it's not really. We have a little bit, but it all seems to be out of situ and we're just going through lots of garden soil and yeah. demolition layers, and that's really about it. Right. My biggest concern at the moment is, I found this 1912 map here. Right. Of the excavations done then. You can see this is foundations of brick for brick wall of Wainfleet's times, with a little note here saying foundations are over six foot below the present surface. Yeah, but is that the top or the bottom of the foundations? Well, my pick is well, it's going uh, to be the top. Uh, uh, either way, Jonathan, it's a long way down, isn't it, to what, it is. to what we've got here? It, it is. is. And the wall, if you look at the scar on the tower at the moment, should run through about here. Right. OK, so let, let's it. dig the trench for the machine. Mm -hmm. Let's get that far and then think about it again. Yeah. yeah. OK. So Bridge and Matt will have to dig a lot deeper to find the wall. But in the back garden, Phil's keen to know whether he's found the first clues to the buildings on the early plan and hopefully Wainfleet's palace. Hey, I think I've got something here that might interest you. These are brilliant. The glazing, it basically, it's a Tudor floor tile. A Tudor? Yeah, so it dates from about 1500s onwards. 
No, hang on, Jonathan. <laughs> I thought you said this morning this place was pre-Tudor. Yeah. Well, now, the gatehouse that survives is, but this has been a manor of the bishops of Winchester since the early 13th century. So, Wainfleet wasn't the first builder, and he certainly wasn't the last. And for these, it could easily be someone like the bishop of the first half of Henry VIII's reign, who was Richard Fox, another great builder in line. It's nearly the end of day one. And although Phil's finding building material, it's later than Wainfleet. And I'm getting worried that we're not any closer to understanding the rest of his magnificent palace. Well, Mick, this trench was a bit of a disaster. We've been digging all day and we've still down on nothing. No, it hasn't at all. We're still working on it. You're always like that at the end of day one. You're always a real misery at the end of day one. We need to do a lot more work in this trench and the same in the other two in there. We're hardly down on the archaeology at all. But also, there's the geophysics of the whole garden, which seems to show some sort of big building, probably a hall. We need to look at that. And then, of course, there's the other gardens, and the one in that direction has got this thing that looks like a big chapel in it. So we can have a look at that as well. What about the documents? I've had a great day, Tony. I've found all sorts of interesting documents about the things that were happening here, but I've also found an account of an exorcism in the buildings oh. that were over there, which actually adds to what we know about the arrangement of the rooms. Excellent. So tomorrow, a hall, a chapel... Maybe even an exorcism. That should raise our spirits. <laughs> it's a joke. Yeah. End of day one is a joke. Oh, Am I allowed to finish on a joke? <laughs> History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Enjoy our rich library of documentaries covering key events and locations of the medieval period. History Hit's medieval offering features leading historians such as Dan Jones, Eleanor Yanega and Kat Jarman. Not only that, but we've a rich library of audio documentaries covering every period of history through our network of podcasts. Sign up now for a free trial, and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. Beginning of day two here in Isha, where we're looking for the rest of the palace to go with that magnificent gateway. And yesterday we got some pretty good clues in Penny's back garden. But one of the buildings that we're looking for is this chapel-y thing, which would have been on this end. And that's not going to be in Penny's place at all, but in one of these back gardens. The Chapley thing is just one of the palace buildings which once lined the banks of the River Mole, and it's shown clearly on the early plan to the south of the palace. We've compared the plan with the modern estate, and we think this building stood two doors down from Penny's Tower. So we've begun to geophys in this back garden to see if any of the structure remains and find out whether it was Wainfleet's chapel. Wainfleet's power extended way beyond the bishopric, he was a great educationalist, headmaster of Winchester, provost of Eton, and built Magdalen College, Oxford. Back at the tower, and Phil's got a captive audience as Penny and her children check up on his progress in her garden. <laughs> in her front garden, we're trying to establish whether Wayne Fleet built a defence round the palace. Have you got this wall yet, Matt? Not quite, Mick, and you can see we're getting pretty deep now. Yeah, it's um, got water in the bottom, I see. It has got water in the bottom, yeah. but according to the 1912 map, we're still about six inches off. Right, are uh, you actually on the right line? Looking at that uh, chamfer up the tower there, mm. I wonder whether it isn't a little bit further back over this way. Yeah, so I think what we've got to do... Yeah. ..is go down a little bit more. Right. But I think, yeah, you're right, we should probably... We've got to go back a bit more as well. ..move a bit more further back. Yeah. So once again, the digger makes its way over to hunt for the elusive wall, while I'm off to the incident room on a little ghost-busting trail. Yesterday, you teased me with the promise of the story of exorcism, and you still haven't told it to me. Well, in the early 17th century, the house was owned by relatives of Francis Drake, the great Francis Drake, who'd fought the Spanish Armada. And the lady of the house, Joan Drake, suddenly woke up one night and shrieked and screamed and said that she was possessed by... The devil. So her husband sends for an exorcist and he comes to the house uh, and in fact he climbs the stairs and Joan Drake is, is in the dining chamber which is on the first floor and she sees him coming so she races upstairs to her bedroom and bolts the door. So her husband chases after her with a great iron fork in his hand and beats on the door. Well what happens next is that in fact they send for more exorcists and they're up in the chamber above Joan Drake's bedchamber and they pray and they fast. And as far as I can tell from the documents, about eight years later, Joan Drake is finally reconciled to Christ. Well, it's a lovely story, and 
a happy ending. But does it help us at all? Well, I think it does because, in fact, what it shows is that if the dining chamber, which we know has to be on the first floor because that's how things were then, so if Joan Drake's chamber, her bedchamber, was on the floor above uh, and these three Puritan exorcists are on the floor above that, it has to be a four-storey lodging. Do we know what she was doing with the devil? Well, she, she, she said that she committed the unpardonable sin. This is a family show, but have we any idea what that might mean? Well, it could involve, you know, the idea that she'd had carnal congress with the devil. Good Lord. <laughs> Back at the tower, Phil's found more walls than he can, well, shake a brick at. Look, there's a face of stone that runs along there. You've got a big block of stone in there, block of stone in there, and there's a block... All the way along there, that comes in there. I mean... I was wondering whether this isn't the earliest, earliest war we got on the site. It's, it's, it's just complicated, very, very complicated. While Phil struggles with too many walls and Matt struggles to find one, Jonathan's taken me to nearby Hampton Court. Just over three miles away, Hampton Court was built by one-time Isha resident Cardinal Woolsey, and Jonathan wants to show me just how much it owes to Waynefleet. What's the date of this place? January 1515 is when Woolsey's carpenters and masons turned up and the materials poured in for Hampton Court. But at that time, when it was a building site, he lived on Waynefleet's manor at Isha. Really? Not Waynefleet's old house, anyway. So every morning when he came in, he'd got that image of Isha in his mind. I'm sure, absolutely he did. You can certainly see Waynefleet's influence in these diamond patterns and the look of the brickwork. You can, Tony, but look carefully at them. See the way in which they don't really line up. They're all over the place. Now, Wayne Fleet's mason set that diaper work perfectly. Yeah. It's very organised on the facade. It's tightly built. It's a kind of relief to know that even Cardinal Wolsey had problems with his build, isn't it? It's a huge contrast to Wayne Fleet's crisp diamond patterns picked out in a black glaze. No cowboys on this job but no one really knows how this effect was achieved. So we've called in brickmaker Tony Minter and glaze specialist Beryl Hines to experiment. So what are you putting into these glazes? Well, we've got four glazes that we're trying out. Um, the first one has got a potash felspar with some clay. The second one is soda ash with some clay. The third one, wood ash with some clay. And the fourth one is a fairly traditional uh, medieval-style lead glaze with some copper in it. Right. How have you come up with those um, recipes? Have you got them from documentary evidence or have you done any scientific analysis to come up with them? Well, there is no documentary evidence. So how are we going to get the glazes onto the brick? Well, we're going to dip them and we're going to brush them. Yeah. Can I have a go? Mm, please do. Right, so I just paint it on with this brush, do I? Shall yeah. I have a go? Yeah. Here we go, then. So the bricks are coated with the four experimental glazes, hoping to replicate the black finish of the diaper pattern. It's now a 24-hour wait while they're fired in a kiln at over 1,000 degrees. Two doors down from the tower, John's got the geophys results for the Chapley building. We've got these responses here. Now, they're, they're actually in this area. Where Look, this sort of little bit of where a drop we've got the off ridge. is over we've here. We've got high readings down there that might just be make up for the river. But I'd have thought if we put a trench across here, yeah. um, then we can investigate what that is. Yeah, it's perhaps a, what, a two by two or something like that. Or something across here. Just small to start with. To see I mean, what we've we got don't wreck the garden totally, do yeah. we? Yeah, okay, let's do that then. Mark it out for us. Yep. Then a swim? Uh, only if it warms up a bit. <laughs> After a day and a half in Penny's front garden, Matt might finally have made a breakthrough in the wall trench. Hold it there for a second, in. Think. There we go. Oh, without a doubt. Ah, and there's a course down there as well. Uh, that's the other side there. Really? Definitely. So we've got one bit there. And one part of the wall there. So what am I standing on here? Matt seems to have hit a brick wall in more ways than one. While in the neighbouring garden, things are just getting started, as Kerry opens a trench to search for the Chapley structure. And in Penny's back garden, Rakshar's opened another trench based on John's geophys results, which showed a large building, possibly a great hall. Now, Phil's cleaned up the walls in his trench, he's pretty sure he's found part of it. If this is the Great Hall coming along like this, geophysics says that it doesn't run the other side of the path. Right. right? 
<coughs> so if this is the corner of the hall, I'd like to resolve whether or not it turns this way. Yeah. If it if it's absent from there, yeah. we know that the hall has got to be this way and yeah. not that way. Yeah, yeah, or in yeah. other words, whether we got the front corner or a back corner. Yeah. Good. Very good. Keen to solve this puzzle, Phil and Jonathan want to know whether Raksha's trench holds any clues. Raksha. Oh, hello. How are you doing on? Doing very well, actually. We've got this this wall running down here, and it's still it's composed of the similar material that Phil has in his trench. We have something coming up this side, which is composed of flint and mortar. Not, I can't really see what's going on because I think we need to extend that way. Mm. And then we have this floor running through here, and I'm wondering whether it's a corridor or not. Is there any chance? You're walking on a floor that's made up of bits of rubble and cement or mortar that would have had tile on the top of it. Yeah, it's, it's possible. We had lots of tile coming out of the demolition layer. Because that wall looks a lot like your... Well, that's the it? obvious thing. It's exactly the same composition as the wall I got running parallel to it, and it's also the same composition as the one that looks as though it's coming parallel to the pathway. What sort of distance we got? Well, let's measure it out, Phil. Well, we, uh, we got a, we well, got a tape? Uh, yeah, never mind about tapes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, five, four, five, six, six seven, seven, eight, eight nine, ten. About ten metres. Well, that's foot. got 30 foot, isn't it? It's just over 30 foot. So that's, that's exactly right for a great hall. Yeah, absolutely. Like that. Yeah, I like that. bang on typical, nice. So we found the Great Hall, which ties in perfectly with our plan, and it must have been part of Waynefleet's palace. The hall's made of stone, so would have been built earlier than the brick gatehouse. We've also located a wall in the front garden. It's made of brick, but is it Waynefleet? Hey, Jonathan, come and look at this lot. Mate, I can have a nose. Yeah, come in. This is all getting very, very complicated now, look. You've got two walls going on. We've got the first wall here. Yeah. It's lovely flat face down to there and from there downwards is the slightly more messy foundation and also appears there's been a drain cut through it there. We carried on back, there's rubble, so either the wall has collapsed down here like that or it could be the beginning of a culvert which came up like that. And then we hit another wall, or in fact it's more of a large plinth with a kind of triangular feature on top which seems to have a couple of bricks heading off in that direction. That 1912 map didn't show two walls here, did it? Not at all. It showed one wall marked coming straight up this way. Quite a wide wall, but... And this is that wall, do you think, that's shown in 1912? It seems to be on the right alignment, a little bit off. So does that mean there's a passageway between these two walls, then? Well, there doesn't seem to be any floor in between, in between these two right. walls. They're also not quite aligned together. Yeah. So they could be different phases as well. So is this Bishop Waynefleet, then? Because we came... We dug this hole thinking this might be a defensive wall mm. built by the bishop. That's what was claimed in the early map, wasn't yeah. it? But I need to get down and have a look cool. at the bricks. Go down and have a look. Compare them with the tower. Let's have a look. Jonathan, I'm going to leave you to carry on with this, and I'll come back later when you've sorted it <laughs> oh, out. All right. right. See you then, Mick. As the archaeologists try to date the wall, Mick the Twig's busy working on his wood samples, trying to find a precise date for the tower. Bridge is casting an expert eye over a coin we found and historian John Guy is ploughing through the records, searching for evidence of Wayne Fleet's building project. And by the tower, there's been another find. Stuart Penley's done some great research, and she pulled out this plan from the Bodleian Library mm. in Oxford, and it's by John Albury, the mm. surveyor. I think it's a great plan, so I've, I've, I've been able to spend a little bit of time looking at it. There's the gatehouse there, there's, there's your wall. But also, there's this, the tower keep, which is probably the most important building on the site. I couldn't stop playing once I, once I got my teeth into this. <laughs> um, and I've put it against the, the modern map. There's the gatehouse there. There's your wall. That's where the keep is, and the majority of it is in next door's garden. What this basically means and tells us is that the most important building on the site is actually just behind these trees here, we might just be able to get a bit of it. Can we dig it? Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's enough room to, to get in there. There's a strip down here we could dig in, but I think the majority oh, is kind of... Oops, over there. <laughs> we might be able to unearth a key building on the early plan, a whole castle keep. And it's a great opportunity to discover whether or not Waynefleet was building with defence in mind. 
and as digging starts, I've heard that Mick the Twig might have some news for us. Hello, you two. Dendro date. Dendro date. What is it? I don't know. He won't tell me. He's been very secretive. You are such a tease. No, Tony, you had to be here for this. I've actually got to eat humble pie. Here was me saying this wood was absolutely useless. Yeah, yeah. And, I got and to the say, rest. And the rest, <laughs> which, which, yes. Well, actually, I've actually got to tell you that I've managed to get a date out of it. And what we've managed to do is get the date range down to 1462 to 1472. Fantastic. It's pre-Farnham. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's pre-Hampton Court and it's pre Farnham. That's wonderful. I'm so <laughs> pleased. I, this is an undisguised <laughs> triumph. <laughs> it's not a That's competition. Fantastic. There you go, you can have that. <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. Well, Penny seems to be pleased. Not bad going for day two, but will Mix Dendro help us understand Wainfleet's palace? The Dendro date. 1462 to 1472. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's, that's very nice, isn't it? Yeah. But when Penny heard, she went, it's earlier than Farnham. Far far <laughs> <laughs> Triumph. Very Farnham. good. Well, it yeah. makes a lot of sense, too. Wainfleet opens Parliament in 1459 with, a, with an impassioned speech of let peace and unity be amongst you all, because we're in the Wars of the Roses, aren't we, at that date? Yeah, yeah. And in 61, his fears are realised because he's besieged in his own house at East Meehan. So to, to make a castle-like palace from 1462 makes a lot of sense to me. But do we have anything archaeological that marries with that kind of date? Ah, oh, well, look at this. This is a silver coin from the demolition of the hall. Yeah. It's an Irish penny of Edward IV. And these are really quite uncommon because they're not supposed to circulate in England because they're lightweight and this one's been clipped terribly anyway. And it dates to 1473 to 8. <laughs> <laughs> very close, isn't oh, it? That's, that's very good, isn't it? Mick, what about what I have been referring to all day as the chapel y type thing oh, yeah, yeah. on the edge of the complex? Is it a chapel? I would doubt it. I would need a lot of convincing, actually. I, I can't see a big freestanding chapel like that. OK, so we're thinking at the moment probably not chapel. Is there anything that we can be sure about in terms of what buildings we use for what? Well, I think we've actually got a, a keep, a castle-like keep. John Aubrey in 1673 describes things as being castle-like. And that 1606 map seems to show that in one it, corner. It does, and his plan shows a thing here which looks like a square keep with turrets on the corners, yeah. just like a castle. So are we beginning to look at a complex which is essentially about defence? Yeah, I think at various times in its history, it probably was a more defensive structure, probably early on and probably later on, and it would have looked like a castle. So tomorrow we'll start looking not so much at Isha Palace, but something a little bit more like Isha Castle. Yeah. Beginning of day three here in Penny's back garden in Isha, where we were looking for Isha Palace, except now we think that at least some of the time it had a much more defensive function, maybe something more like Isha Castle. And this being day three, some of our lads have been here since seven o'clock this morning because they think that in these trees somewhere there might be a really important, significant trench. Actually, it's more like a badger in here, I think. They reckon, thank you, that there could be the keep in there. Although yesterday, you said that the majority of the keep was in the next garden. So why is this so important? Yeah, that's right. The majority of the keep is in the next garden. It's just possible that this strip down here might be within Penny's garden, but the majority is in the other garden. There's no doubt about it. Look. That's the survey next door. You can see the keep quite clearly. This dotted line is the avenue of trees behind us, and the keep extends across here. So you haven't been able to geofiz behind the trees? No, but it, it extends round like that. So could these red bits actually be the tip of the keep? Yeah, and we're digging in here. It's looking good. Yeah. We've made loads of progress. There's a great hall opposite Penny's gatehouse, We've found a wall, though we're not sure how it fits into Wainfleet's grand scheme, and now we've got the chance to discover and date a whole castle keep. The site's now a hive of activity. Bridge is busily digging in our chapelly trench, and the diggers continue their early morning efforts on the keep trench. I'm keen to see how the great hall fits together in Penny's back garden, so Jonathan's giving me a guided tour. Rakshar is on the other side, yeah. picking up on the geophysics. It was very clear 
and there is another piece of ironstone masonry. That's the other side of the hall. So what's the logic of that? Why is it here like this? Well, you see, nothing should impede the relationship of the gatehouse to the hall because you need to be guided through to the entrance to the whole complex. OK, so I come through the gatehouse. Yeah, and the hall is the assembly space. Yeah. So come with me, you're now walking through the porch and you've gone through Raksha's wall, you're into the hall now. There's the kitchens over there, they're knocking up dinner for you. This is where... You, as a bishop, Bishop Tony, yeah. um, have a court, you have retainers, you have staff. This is your, basically, your staff canteen and big reception space. It's an all-in-one, multifunctional extravaganza. So I come in here? Yeah, so through the timber screen, and Aubrey describes a roof here with angels holding up shields. Fabulous vision and bits of stained glass. So from the south, the stained glass will shine through on a platform at the far end where the bishop sits presiding over everyone. Now, when he's finished his meal, he's going to go up his stairs. Off he goes. There's bishop, warmth, bed, comfort, far end. There's the kitchens, noise, dirt, smell, danger. The hall separates everything out into, into servant's end and posh. Well, that's that bit sorted out. Let's go <laughs> to the next Let's have a look. So not only have we identified the Great Hall, but thanks to documents, we've got an idea what it looked like inside. Helen's keen to find out what else the documents can tell us. John, now we've got that dendro date, 1462 to 1472, the building of the gatehouse, is there anything in the pipe rolls that would help us narrow down that date even further? There was a word I couldn't read, and uh, I've read it now. What I've translated it? it. It's zabili. That means sable. And you think, well, that's yeah. a fur, you know, for a gown or decorating a hood. But in fact, I discovered from the Wolsey building accounts that he had sables and they were ropes and they were special ropes for gins, that's the engines, and cranes, the heavy duty lifting equipment uh, of late medieval, early modern building sites. So there's some major building project going on? In 1462 to 3, and obviously a rope had snapped and so they had to yeah, replace it. So, so it occurs in those repair accounts. So is that enough of a smoking gun? It's very, us. it's highly suggestive. Highly suggestive. That's fantastic. We've now got the evidence which proves Waynefleet commissioned major works around 1462. We know he built the gatehouse opposite a medieval great hall, and I'm spurred on to find out whether that wall and the keep were part of his grand design. And then there's that other building in the next door garden. Well, John, you reliably informed me that there was going to be something in this trench. We've gone down through what looks like just demolition, makeup layers, and just hit natural geology. You've summed it up. It's the makeup that we saw. Just that gravel layer will give us the effect. That would be that... enough to give you that signal, would it? Yeah, because the clay is so wet, and that is dry by contrast. Right. So it's just mm -hmm. the makeup. Right. right. So, I mean, the, the main thing we can see from this trench no building. I think we can shut this down then. Should we shut down this garden then, Mick? Yes, I think so. You know, don't fancy a dip first? Well, I, I quite fancy a bit of a dip. You said no to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a disappointment, but we can't really complain. We found the hall and the keep trench looks very promising. Penny, we're looking for the last piece of the jigsaw. You know, we've got the hall. The really big thing that we're looking for is the keep. That's why we're digging in amongst the trees. And we think that this brick wall might actually be the wall of the keep. You know this plan anyway, but you know your house is there. Yes. And the keep is there. Now, the crucial thing is going to be whether or not we can find one of these octagonal towers. In fact, they're exactly the mirror Im image of what you've got on the corner of your house. Exactly the same thing. So, we reckon that if this is the keep, the key identification thing is whether or not this wall carries straight on or whether it splays out into the turret. Fabulous. And I reckon that we are just about a point to know whether or not that's true or not. Fantastic. Because <laughs> you see, look, we've got a wall coming along there and it's going straight there. Ooh. Look. Oh! <laughs> Amazing! That's just brilliant! So what would have been in that turret? Another staircase or I don't know what have you got what have you got in your <laughs> what have you got in your turret? What, this... <laughs> <laughs> well, what have you got in your turret? A spiral staircase. Well, probably a good bet then that you've got a spiral staircase. But Amazing. That, but that has got to be the key. That is splaying out. 
got the castle, you've got the keep in your garden. The keep trench is getting more exciting with each bucket load. And John and his dear Fizz seem to have found a fan in Penny. Science Just... is amazing, isn't it? Hear that, this Phil? technology oh. here. What's that? Amazing. 21st century science. Are you impressed by I'm that? I'm very impressed. Oh, good very Lord, if you, if you work with him as long as if you if, if work with him as long as we have, you'd know this was just a mere fluke. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just ignore that. You get on in, with your toys. <laughs> Things are also shaping up nicely in the wall trench. Have you sorted this yet, you chaps? There's been a breakthrough, Mick. Oh, I like breakthroughs, <laughs> that's good. We have got, can you see down here, see the brick floor here, which joins up this wall and this wall. Ah. Uh, so they were definitely contemporary. Right. So does that help us, Jonathan, in explaining what it is? Yeah, it does. If you're, if you're standing in what's a passageway, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And this is a pier there, so that a column of, of brickwork rose from it. Right. This ties in exactly with what John Aubrey shows in his 1670s survey right. of this being a whole arcaded wall with a terrace on top. Oh, and that explains right. the bulk. So I we're think. underneath it here. Exactly. You're just outside the wall. Yeah. That is under the terrace. And so about five feet over our head would have been a walkway. You see? Right. Now I've been looking at the bricks. Yesterday, all I had to go on was the standard brick size that looked like Wayne Fleet was using on the tower. Well, that's nine to nine and a half inches by about four and a half. Yeah. But, but these go from nine and a half up to ten. So actually, the brick, you can't make a typology here. So we've got to look at another way of reading this. And the way to do it is to follow this terraced wall and see what its relationship is with the gatehouse. So we've got to look at the gatehouse now. Here's what's we? going to hold the info, yep. Right. So, Mick, the bricks are all over the place. We're not yeah. going to learn much from them. So the building's got to speak to us. Now, that feature up there... Yeah. Well, it's a window. It's a window now, isn't it? But what about the proportion? Ah, it's more like a doorway, isn't it? It is, too. Yeah. It yeah. is. Did Wainfleet have that door put in? Or is it later? Well, there's no ragged hole around it. It's contemporary with the tower, isn't it? Absolutely. But now it goes out onto thin air. If it is a two-storey wall, there should be some way of getting to the underside of it. Well, that's rather good, isn't it? Yeah. So we should find some means of getting into it from the stair turret. Look at this, Mick. Ah, yes, I noticed this. Oh, but it makes a lot more sense now, because yes, it's yeah. bang on line with Matt's trench. Yeah, yeah. If the stairs once carried round, you might have the option of going up or down, but that yeah. would lead you down to the underside of that yeah. double-decker wall outside. So that's the lower doorway. Yeah. That's right, yeah, but up the stairs here, look, let's see how the... That window was once... Look, it's a door. Now, you've even got one of the pintles of the door left look in the wall there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's a flipping lock. Look, catch plate down there. <laughs> well, that all makes a lot more sense now. Doesn't it? it? So we'd walk out there onto the top level of a big yeah. arched wall, yeah. maybe with crenellations on the top, and it does feel like something of a castle defense, yeah. doesn't yeah, it? Yes, yeah. That's brilliant, that is. <laughs> it all makes sense. So we've found our defensive wall of two levels with a covered walkway on top. And what's more, it's pure Wayne Fleet. But Penny's not going to let us stop now. She's certain there's more of that keep down there. It would be wonderful to get the return so we know the you're, proportion. You're, you're talking like an archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> Just the more you dig, the more we find out. I know. So, but the um, more we've got to put back. Well, I'll put it back. Just oh. please. <laughs> <laughs> if, All right, we'll take out a bit more. <laughs> if, if, the, um, if the taking away of it's the problem, then... I'll help put it back. <laughs> I'd just rather you Took find out me a bit more. Yes, please. All right, we'll take out a bit more. Phil doesn't seem to need a lot of encouragement for Penny to get her way. The glazed bricks have been fired for 24 hours, and it's the moment to see whether our experiment to replicate the finish on Wayne Fleet's diaper work has been a success. Is this the um, glaze that we thought was going to be the feldspar, potash feldspar? Yes. No, no, this is the one. And the temperature hasn't gone high enough to flux the glaze, so it hasn't melted at all. No, it's completely unshiny. It doesn't even look like glaze. No, no. Now, and the wood ash hasn't melted either. 
So does that mean that the temperature needed to get over 1,000 degrees yes. then uh, to create the glaze? If we'd gone any hotter, the brick would have melted. It's actually begun yeah, to distort. Yeah, it's begun to shape, yeah. 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 This is an incredibly vivid one here. Well, that's the lead glaze with copper in. So, Tony, are you happy that, that we've re reproduced something similar to Wayne Fleet's tower? Uh, I have spent about four and a half years trying to achieve this effect and fired nearly a thousand bricks and this is the best so far. And for me what's so amazing about this is the incredible glittery effect that you get. You, there's just no way you could do this with stone. No, absolutely not. While Bridge and Helen have rediscovered the lost art of brick glazing, Phil and Penny are making sterling progress and the octagonal turret is beginning to take shape. This is a, a strange twist for time, team. There's all the experts standing on the edge of the trench watching the owner of the garden do the digging. <laughs> Have you enjoyed yourself? Very much so. I'm a willing apprentice. What's he like as a teacher? I've got no complaints. She's... Bit cheeky at times. She's still under instruction. Yes. <laughs> you said that you thought that this trench would be the linchpin of everything that we were doing. Yeah. What is it that we found? Well, this is one of the most amazing things I've seen on some time team. This is a corner of a vast brick keep that must have accompanied the gatehouse. And it's Wayne Fleet's character of building. And this should have been his lodgings. And the whole arrangement would have been impressive, wouldn't it? You know, you imagine coming through the big brick gatehouse into a courtyard, and no sooner have you got past that that's impressive, you get into a courtyard out here, and there in front of you is an even bigger brick tower. When you come through the gatehouse that he's built, he has a two-storey wall with a terrace on the top. He's got, he's got his own private link between the gatehouse and his lodgings, because that's what this is all about. It's smart lodgings in a place that looks like a defensible castle. What's the relationship of this keep with the Great Hall? Does he live in both of them or does he live in one of them? I think it depends on whether he's visiting here as a stopping-off route yeah. you know, yeah. on his way to London or whether he's having visitors here, because if he needs to entertain, then he's going to be in the hall and retreat to the lodging. If he's on his own, he may as well just walk through the gatehouse and lock the, himself in his room. The hall's a big display place, isn't it, where, you know, you have feasting, you, you show off how wealthy you are, how much food you've got and so on. He's not going to do that if he's just going to come in for a, you know, a pint and a sandwich on the way <laughs> on the journey. <laughs> well, it's the perfect end to our three days in Isha. A major brick-built palace that had been lost for 300 years. He wanted Wayne Fleet's reputation restored. It seems like he's kind of done it himself, doesn't it? Got this massive gatehouse, put a defensive wall, a curtain wall, all the way around it. Lots of buildings here for food preparation, kitchen, great hall dominating the middle of this area. And right over there, even bigger than the gatehouse, a keep and virtually all of the buildings in your garden. Good story, isn't it? It's superb.